saying uh, this is um, my latest paper on common ownership. I'll be presenting today. In this paper, we focus on fintech markets. So as I said, this is joint work with Ludmila Nekseva and Jose Azar, who are both um, financial and IO economists uh, at the ASA Business School. So I'm the law person on this paper. Um, uh, so what is, uh, why cannot change, okay. So how do we structure the paper? What was, um, uh, what is the broad uh, picture or message that we want to highlight here? Um, we have, like, we realize that this is a completely, uh, mostly because fintech are startups and private companies. So the environment that we had to encounter was very different and we got that understanding very soon once we start to look at the empirical data. So the first thing that we do in this paper is start uh, trying to understand um, if common ownership is an empirically significant phenomenon also in this um, context of fintech markets. And then following up from that, what is the impact of this common ownership um, on competition and innovation? Because fintech is one industry where innovation is an important factor. Uh, then uh, we um, focus more on the particularities of this market, uh, both with regards to um, corporate governance and the dynamics of control, but also with regards to um, market competition. Um, and then in the end, we draw some uh, lessons or implications for competition policy and enforcement. So that's a broad picture. Now, how did, like, why? Okay, maybe some of you actually don't even know what common ownership is. So let me just give a very brief um, uh, you know, hint or definition. Uh, this scholarship came to the fore uh, a few years back because of some studies uh, that were done in the U.S. context mostly, suggesting that, you know, um, institutional investors, big asset managers like BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, have pervasive uh, common shareholdings in many competing firms um, in certain industries. Um, so what these studies showed, um, most notably studies in U.S. airlines and banks, uh, they showed that the effects on competition could be quite significant. Um, this was a phenomenon that was not perceived uh, before, uh, especially in the context of public firms, so publicly listed firms, okay? Um, and this uh, change of ownership, of ownership structures is um, mostly due to uh, the recent phenomenon of mutual and index funds, okay? That is a very, uh, a very often observed phenomenon in U.S. Uh, markets. Um, so uh, that research caused alarm, both uh, in corporate governance and finance, but mostly in the competition circles. Uh, because, as I said, the effects on competition and consumers were seen to be significant if that hypothesis held true. Now, in my own work, previous work, I've said, like, look, okay, yes, common ownership in this context of institutional investors is very important because of the dimensions of the problem, as, is, as it was highlighted by empirical work, but in theory, the problem or the phenomenon is even broader. Why? Because it doesn't need to be contained to a specific type of common shareholder or commonly held firms. And this is how this paper um, is linked, so to say, or provides a bridge to the previous setting of public firms um, that was studied. Uh, as I've already explained, fintechs are different because here we have private firms and startups, and they have different characteristics in terms of financing, uh, governance, structures, and so on. And also, we highlight in this paper that, you know, you, um, the data, the empirical uh, data that was um, found in the U.S. may be not be holding or be uniform across different jurisdictions or countries. So two motivations were to see if, uh, you know, the results that were found earlier 
can be replicated in this uh, more innovative setting of an industry such as uh, fintech and across various countries. Now, in theory, and what we're showing in this paper, in a nutshell, is that essentially the degree and effects of, com um, of common ownership um, vary, and they vary across markets, both product and geographic markets, but also, very importantly, what we try to highlight in this paper is that essentially the effects depend very much on the type of investors, and the type of firms uh, in which we can um, observe a common ownership. And why is that? Because uh, the ownership and the governance structures are different, okay? And that affects the dimensions of the problem. Uh, it's also very interesting, this FinTech setting that we're investigating, we think, because here we see the tension, the traditional tension and potentially opposing effects uh, between competition and innovation. And although we don't uh, necessarily touch upon this in this paper, we also highlight that there could be different uh, or opposing effects on intra and in their industry common ownership situations. Okay, so this is a very big picture. Now let's look at the data. In, in the beginning of the paper, we try to give um, uh, some facts about how the FinTech landscape in general looks like. And we can see from the first table that we have in the paper that the biggest fintech markets in the world are the US, the UK, and China. However, if you take Europe as a total, which is at the bottom of both of these uh, tables that uh, follow different rankings, depending on the number of fintech companies or the amount invested, then Europe comes um, actually second uh, if you take them as a whole. So it is still a very important uh, setting. Uh, if we now see the characteristics of, of the top investors in fintech worldwide, we see a very different um, type of investor uh, compared to the situation of um, common ownership in the US in the context of airlines and banks, as I've already said, where we see the big three asset managers. Uh, here we see that the majority of common investors in fintech are basically VC and private equity firms, okay? And even if we take the whole population of investors, uh, this doesn't change, okay? And we have this pie chart that shows this uh, nicely, and you see that asset managers have a very tiny um, percentage, about 2% um, worldwide of total fintech investment. However, one caveat here is that this only captures uh, these numbers, the direct investments of the big three asset managers in fintech. So any indirect investments through VC or private equity are not. Okay. So what do we do next? We're trying to zoom into the specificities of each country and see if these top 10 fintech investors are the same or similar of the same type. How does it look? Um, so all in all, um, the type of investors doesn't change substantially. So in most countries, we see that the majority of the top 10 investors are still private equity and VC firms. However, um, there are a few things that are different. So one thing is the number of common shareholdings that we see. A second thing is the, or in other words, when we mean common shareholdings, shareholder overlaps, okay? In um, when an investor has um, uh, parallel shareholdings in two competing firms. Uh, we also see different numbers in terms of company overlaps in how many of those firms a common shareholder is present, okay? And then we are also trying to capture the um, collective share of these top 10 investors by, uh, in each country. And we see that those numbers uh, differ from country to country. So, for example, here in the first um country that we list, that is the UK, we see that the joint share is actually very low, 17.86. Um, by comparison, I don't know how I can move 
Okay, yeah. Uh, Spain uh, is much more concentrated. If we see the number, uh, the total number of the top 10 investors jointly, okay? Um, next, other countries in the EU, there's some interesting facts here. For example, in Sweden, for some weird reason, we do see BlackRock appearing in this chart. So it is one example of an asset manager that appears somewhere as a common owner. And then a very big outlier is also Ireland when we see that the government, um, as opposed to private entities, um, are a very significant uh, common owner as well. And we see, especially in Ireland, that also the joint share of the top 10 investors is actually pretty high. So this is Europe. If we look at um, other uh, continents and countries, uh, things are still a little bit different. Uh, the US is a notable example. We see, if you see the total number that I've highlighted here to 218, uh, where, uh, which is the number of companies that um, uh, common shareholders have minority holdings. Uh, that's a pretty high number compared to all the other countries. So that means that we have many common shareholdings. Um, however, uh, in, interestingly, uh, the US has the lowest number, 11.04, in terms of the total share of the top 10 investors. So how can we interpret that? That means essentially that although there are many common shareholdings, the size of those shareholdings are pretty small, okay? Um, in some other countries such as Brazil, um, higher concentration of the total top 10 share. And we also see an investment back here coming into the picture. I think uh, in the next slide, Indonesia, uh, somewhere, yeah, is the same. But also we see here that we have a corporate VC um, as a very big investor in this country too. In China, not so much concentration overall, but we see um, that Sequoia is a very important investor uh, that has a lot of... Um, uh, shareholder and company overlaps. So a little bit different dynamics in each country. Um, now, if we look at this combined share, so the last column in all of these previous tables that I showed, uh, and we do a comparison across countries and continents, we observe one thing that they have in common. And what is that? One trend we observe is that um, the highest combined share of those uh, top 10 investors, we can see in countries where the, um, the number of fintech companies is smaller. So this is something that is consistent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, then in the paper, we show an example of two networks of two um, uh, extremes, let's say, in the European context, uh, Sweden and the UK. And we focus on a subsegment of um, uh, fintech market, and that is payments. And why we have this uh, graph here is to show that, okay, intuitively, if you look at Sweden and the UK, you see that the network in the UK is much more dense. However, um, as we suggest in the paper, by just seeing this graphically, you actually cannot understand the effects of common ownership and competition or draw inferences about what are the actual effects. So obviously, in the Swedish uh, context, you see that there is only one uh, large uh, group of investors backing this um, uh, blue, big blue uh, dot in the middle that is Klarna. So essentially there is low overlap of investors, so low common ownership. So in the UK, it's a bit more complicated, but if you take the numbers and you don't just uh, observe things visually, you realize that common ownership also here is much lower than uh, one may intuitively, I think. And why is that? Because you see that almost 80% of all the investors, even in the UK, only have one uh, portfolio company in um, one company in the portfolio, so no overlaps. 
Um, and then, um, you know, uh, only 11% hold uh, two fintech companies. So there is some common ownership, 10 that have more than two and so on. Okay. So we're saying essentially you need to um, uh, measure the effects um, and go into the specifics, know the details about this market in order to assess what is really going on. Okay. Now, uh, next we go on uh, precisely to estimate the impact of the common ownership we observe in uh, different fintech markets. And uh, we start with uh, some theoretical background um, on common ownership, which means that uh, there is research that and theory that shows that Common ownership creates economic effects, both, both positive and negative, and competition and innovation. And those effects very much depends on the context and circumstances. Now, the magnitude of those effects um, can be estimated by measuring uh, the common owner's weights, which is exactly what we're doing in this paper, following an unilateral effects analysis. Uh, in the later, in the last part of the paper, we also have some discussion about how cross ownership may interact with common ownership, and we discuss if we see M and A in this context of fintech markets, not only full acquisitions but also minority acquisitions. Okay, and this perhaps could mean some things, uh, especially strategic concerns, as we highlight. Um, and then we delve into the specific theories of harm when it comes to competition effects, both unilateral and coordinated, but also potential efficiencies that common ownership creates. So let's take this one by one, and um, I will give you an overview of what we say in the paper. So common ownership can create unilateral effects. What does this mean? It means that it can lead to um, reduce incentives to compete, innovate, or enter markets. Why so? Uh, fundamentally, the basic uh, thing that changes under common, common ownership is that the firm object, um, the objective function of the firm is changing under common ownership and is assumed that um, managers uh, maximize uh, portfolio value and not firm value. Um, so that is why we have anti-competitive, potential anti-competitive effects and unilateral uh, incentives to raise prices and so on. And how uh, is that happening? As I've already mentioned, uh, the assumption here is that common ownership affects the objective function of the manager uh, because the manager will maximize the total portfolio profits of the common shareholders, taking into account their holdings in uh, competing firms, okay? And that, as a result, may alter the behavior of the firm and may increase its market power. Uh, now, common ownership does not necessarily create harmful effects uh, in all situations, uh, as I've already hinted, uh, but it can in oligopolistic markets, okay? And why is that? Because uh, aggressive competition in oligopoly imposes negative externalities on firms and common shareholders. So those common shareholders do have an incentive to internalize them. And potentially, if they have control, they may have the power to influence firm, firm management to do so as well. Now, in terms of mechanisms of control, um, different kinds of investors could have uh, different challenge, uh, channels of influence. So, for example, active investors can intervene more, for example, we see in private firms. Uh, and then, but however, passive investors could also exert some influence through voting uh, in the situation where there are no bigger block holders potentially in the governance structure of the companies. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they can impose their objectives on the managers fully, but maybe the managers do take into account those common owners' incentives to some extent. So. The flip side of uh, seeing this is to say that there could be some residual managerial agency costs in this uh, passive situation. Now, um, 
uh, there are two ways that we can quantify those unilateral effects due to common ownership. Uh, there is the modified HHI uh, that tries to capture how much additional concentration we have in the market and um, under competitive incentives and market power because of the common owners profits and control in rivals. Uh, and there is a second approach uh, which relies on the com oh, excuse me on the common owners weights uh, and it's the approach that we use in this paper. It's also called the lambdas. Uh, and here we try to directly capture the degree of internalization of rivals profits relative to um, the on-firm profits by the firm manager in its objective function. So um, the criticism on the modified HHI is that market shares are endogenous. So um, perhaps a cleaner uh, measure to uh, quantify these effects is the lambdas. This is one reason why we chose uh, this method in this paper. Okay. Common ownership. Anna, is may I ask something very quickly? Sorry for interrupting. Yeah. Okay, so I noticed in the previous slide that you refer almost exclusively to profit. So this word appears three, four times in the slide. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am wondering if uh, there are other things affecting the value um, of a fintech company beyond profits. So let's say I have a lot of patents, but I don't have profits. I have a lot of potential, but I don't make money right now. Do you think that this would matter? Do you think profits is a, a good approximation of the value of the firm? Um, what is your opinion on we this? Don't, I mean, we don't have a discussion as such. I mean, one way to see, you know, if those patents somehow provide some indirect profit, you can still think that, you know, the common owners have a stake in both firms. So the analysts, I don't think, would be too much different. I mean, it is one question how you generalize that when you calculate weights, but that's a practical issue. I don't think it's a theoretical issue, um, but we don't analyze it as such in this paper. I mean, we take the basic scenario and as I will show already later, it's already complicated to be honest. So, I mean, we're trying essentially to replicate what was done in public markets in private markets. I think that's the key takeaway that or objective of this paper and try to see if, you know, the patterns of common ownership or the effects of common are similar or are extremely dissimilar, so to say. Great, thanks a lot. Okay. Um, okay, as I said, in theory, common ownership also can create coordinate effects. Uh, we don't measure uh, in this paper empirically the coordinate effects, but we do have a discussion of uh, the general dynamics. So common ownership can increase the likelihood either of explicit or tacit collusion in different way, uh, ways. Um, and that is like one important thing here is that, you know, uh, potentially the non-commonly held rivals uh, can have an aligned interest in achieving coordinated outcomes because they can share in the super competitive industry profits. Okay, that's the main idea. Um, now the ways or the mechanism of doing that could be different. They could, uh, the common owners could facilitate explicit uh, coordination either, you know, by being a ringmaster. Uh, so more of a cartel situation here through earning calls, private meetings, engagement, and so on. Also because um, big investors usually uh, have privileged access to manager, managers. Um, however, there could be also more subtle mechanism. For example, the common ownership can allow access to information. Um, uh, it can help align incentives, enhance transparency. But also we've seen uh, some literature, also empirical literature suggesting that uh, common ownership can encourage executive compensation packages that are tied to rival or industry performance, and that in itself can help align the incentives of common owners and managers, and therefore it can be some kind of facilitating practice. Um, also, 
uh, common ownership in theory can uh, facilitate tacit collusion by altering the incentives to uh, collude um, rather than compete. Uh, and that is because it increases the incentives to collude and the manager's discount factors, um, while and essentially that is because, as I said in the beginning, the long-term gains from cooperation um, are increased, okay? Uh, now there is uh, another side of the coin. So I think the most interesting thing about all this research on common ownership is that it's not all bad. Uh, if that was so, I don't think so much research will, um, uh, will be going on. Uh, what is fascinating is that the same phenomenon can create also beneficial effects, notably pro-competitive efficiencies for more or less the same reasons. Um, so common ownership can also enhance the ability and incentives to compete and innovate, and essentially in the same way internalize externalities, uh, but in this, um, uh, in this setting, positive ones rather than negative ones, as in the oligopolistic competition setting. Um, interestingly, common ownership can also create benefits for corporate governance and capital markets. However, these efficiencies that are not specific flowing to consumers in antitrust, we consider them out of the market efficiencies. So we don't take them into account. Competition agencies discount them. They don't consider them in um, their substantive assessment. Uh, so what kind of efficiencies could we have due to common ownership, both um, efficiencies in terms of innovation, investment, solving technological and information spillovers uh, problems. Uh, so mitigating essentially from disincentives to innovate and invest in cost reducing R&D, improving innovation uh, productivity, minimizing duplicate efforts and so on. Again, the magnitude of these effects will very much depend on the specifics. So in other words, on the type of common investors firms but also the type of the industries that we observe. Um, and the mechanism, as I have hinted already, is basically the same. Either you have unilateral mechanisms where you have an internalization of externality story through the managers, or you have more active um, mechanisms uh, and potential coordination. Uh, then, uh, one particularly important efficiency, especially in this fintech context, and why we highlight so much the different types of investors that we have here, is that venture capital investors, in particular, where they are common owners, they can have some additional, let's say, beneficial role uh, that we think might be significant. And we have some papers already that, that highlight this. Uh, for example, common VC investors can improve innovation efficiency, they can redu reduce duplication of R&D costs, they can shut down, so pick and choose basically the most promising projects, but also they can facilitate startup growth and um, uh, more capital raising through more investment rounds for um, fintech startups. And importantly, also facilitate information sharing. So the flow of information um, through different fintech startups. Okay. Now we go um, to our measurement of the common owners uh, weights uh, that um, we use in order to um, estimate the effects of common ownership in this setting. Um, and in order to do that, we first estimate each investor's ownership share, and this is the formula we use. And we also use some assumptions in doing that because we don't have comprehensive data uh, about the full ownership in each uh, firm. And these are private firms, as I've already said. So they do not have to publicly report their ownership structures necessarily. So data is a challenge here. Um, so the assumptions we use in this estimation process is basically that all investors con contribute equal amounts in each investment round. So at each time uh, the startup is raising and we use industry benchmark to um, 
to uh, estimate how much is raised in each round. And we also assume that equity that is not sold to outsiders remains with the founder uh, who is a non-common owner, meaning that it doesn't have uh, parallel shareholdings in other competing fintech. Okay, uh, now why we call this common ownership weights lambdas, here you can see the Greek letter A, L, that since uh, we're talking to a Greek university, most of you can uh, feel more familiar with perhaps. Um, so this is the lambda of how we calculate this common ownership weights and what does it mean? It is the weight that each firm that is commonly owned puts on the profits of another firm that is under common ownership. And we see that the lambda depends on the control share of the common shareholder and also its ownership share, okay? Uh, and if we try to put this lambda in the, um, uh, and the control and ownership share in the firm objective function, here is uh, the formula of how to do that. And essentially uh, how the firm objective function is transformed under common ownership is, that, is to say that here firms are maximizing a weighted average of shareholder profits where the weights are the control shares of each common owner. Okay, now we're trying to show uh, the estimated lambdas, those common ownership weights for each country. We take two scenarios for our calculation, um, two extremes, so to say. So what we call a lower limit estimate and an upper limit estimate. So under the lower limit, the founder retains full control of its fintech and it is a non-common owner. And under the upper limit, we assume a situation that is more similar to uh, the already studied uh, publicly listed firm phenomenon where common ownership was found to create significant effects. So what does that mean here? We assume that corporate, um, so firm ownership is dispersed, so among many shareholders, and those shareholders have uh, proportionate control. So not only the, com the common shareholders, but all shareholders. So what do we find? First, it's important to say that we don't see a significant change uh, between the lower limit and the upper limit estimate. So that is one important consideration. Second, we see that in smaller countries, first within Europe, as I highlight here, for example, Ireland or Denmark, they show higher numbers. So higher lambdas, higher potential effects of common ownership compared to uh, bigger jurisdictions. Um, if we take this uh, in other continents, uh, we see the same is in Asia. So a smaller country, uh, like South Korea is more concentrated, so it has um, uh, higher uh, lambda, so higher potential effects. And we do the same exercise uh, by focusing on more narrow uh, fintech uh, product markets, uh, but that does not change our estimations very much. So. The, uh, the general conclusions that we draw are not so much affected either under the upper or the lower limit estimate. The next, uh, the next section of the paper focuses on M&A in fintech markets as um, I've already hinted in the beginning of my presentation. And what are we trying to see here? We're trying to see how often those common shareholders are also perhaps instigating um, either majority or minority uh, mergers and acquisitions uh, in, the, in the firms that they're uh, present. And we do observe some of those and we link this discussion a little bit to the discussion about killer acquisitions. Um, and we suggest that we cannot, we don't have comprehensive data about the MA of these uh, common owners, but it is interesting to uh, actually have more data about this because maybe beyond, um, you know, the ownership and the uh, market-wide phenomenon of common ownership, maybe there are others more 
micro instances of strategic considerations why uh, companies that either are active in the same market, so they're cross owners and common owners, so they have uh, share holdings in many competitors at the same time, what is essentially their motivation for engaging in those transactions? And we give some hints in the paper. Uh, another important, I think, and maybe this is the key message of this paper, is we notice something interesting. Uh, once common owners, uh, sorry, once fintech markets go public, their ownership structure starts to change, but it does not change immediately. So a newly listed um, fintech company will not have a lot of common ownership as I've shown already in previous uh, um, slides. So we see the same, so Panel A here, taking the example of Robinhood, uh, we see that two of its common um, founders uh, are, you know, the major owners of this uh, fintech, even after it goes public, okay, initially. However, for uh, more mature fintech companies, so take Panel B here, and we give the example of PayPal, we start to see that after some years of being listed, we start to see the same big three asset managers that we see in other uh, publicly listed companies in the US, as I might mention, their lines and banks. So BlackRock, Vanguard, State Streets are the biggest owners, common owners uh, in this company. And we show this, uh, we we have another table in the paper where we show which are the lar the largest common owners in public fintech in general. So this pattern is a little bit consistent. Okay. Now, um, what to draw out of all this? In the last part of the paper, we try to draw some conclusions from the empirical analysis that we've done, uh, both with regards to fintech companies in private and public market settings, uh, and also some implications for enforcement. So first, what are the key takeaways here? Uh, with regards to the extent of common ownership, um, what we find uh, in this paper is that in private fintech markets, we don't observe significant uh, overlaps in terms of common ownership in startups, fintech startups. Um, however, the, the numbers uh, uh, we provide in this paper suggest that fintech, um, common ownership in public fintech could be as significant as in other industries, okay? Uh, with regards to the estimated effects and lambdas, uh, we see again a, a, a discrepancy or a difference between uh, private and public markets. So in public markets, the lambdas are significantly higher. Okay. Uh, and what does that all mean? Okay. So we have less common ownership and less, uh, you know, lower lambdas, so to say, in private fintech markets. Um, but essentially, the magnitude and the systemic nature of those effects, uh, it depends very much on the specific ownership and governance structure. So in public markets, as we said, we have more index funds, those index funds are pervasive, they have a systemic character. Um, whereas in private fintech companies we just have vc and private equity investors and although they could be they could have some common shareholders they by comparison they are nothing compared to the uh, public market context a second important consideration is that the control dynamics are very very different in public and private companies okay um, so in private companies, control is more ad hoc. Um, so they could also be private agreements. And essentially, uh, the top owners do not mean that they also have um, the kind of systemic control that they have in uh, public companies. Mm -hmm. So what are the implications for competition policy and enforcement? 
we suggest that from what we see, uh, there is little concern about common ownership in private fintech markets because precisely of what I mentioned in, in the previous slide. So the extent um, or degree of common ownership in those markets and its impact is quite limited. Um, also, the governance of startups and their control dynamics is quite complex, okay, and how control is divided specifically between investors, the co potentially common investors and founders that they may hold control longer, also because of, as I mentioned, uh, particular governance structures or contractual structures such as dual class shares, uh, which serve, in other words, to mitigate any effects of common ownership. On the other hand, uh, there is also one particularity about this uh, private market and fintech setting because control by VC investors um, not only is active, so it's more easily observable and enforcement is easier, but they could also have a beneficial role. Um, on the other hand, uh, yeah, and by contrast, um, perhaps we need to worry more about common ownership in public fintech. Uh, why is that? Because as we've shown, once um, fintech companies are listed, so they go back public and they mature, they become part of the same networks of index funds um, where other publicly listed companies in other industries are part of, and therefore it's more likely that they're owned by these big three asset managers. Um, at the same time, the governance of public firms um, is different, and so the control dynamics are different. And this suggests that also quite small in absolute numbers, common shareholders uh, in this um, dispersed ownership setting of public markets although they may appear uh, passive, they may not always be, okay? Um, the other fact uh, that we highlighted in this paper is that m and in FinTech could uh, um, create uh, concerns for uh, potential additional competition risks, uh, specifically strategic concerns, as I've mentioned. Uh, that could be underappreciated, and so perhaps we need more um, uh, data on this, uh, and um, enforcement should also take into account um, these um, situations. Um, and I think the bottom line out of this paper is essentially the effects are complex, and the common ownership varies from industry or fair or market market and therefore we really need a case-by-case -case analysis and more empirical work to understand precisely what is happening in each of those settings and i think that's it i look forward to your questions this is great thank you so much uh, Anna. Uh, reactions from the floor um yeah. Yes, I was thinking during uh, the presentation, a couple of issues that may be uh, useful for a more general discussion. First of all, okay, the fintech uh, uh, have a specific role. Uh, I would like to see how this fintech, the situation, the case of fintech uh, is related with the bank sector in general. So what do we know? with for the bank sector why the bank sector in terms of common ownership and its influence its impact on um, market outcomes is different than the fintech that's one question and the other thing which is very important and this has to do with both the banks and the fintech sector is how uh, our find the findings uh, of uh, the influence of common ownership on um, uh, market outcomes, uh, how this can be related with uh, the spread of a financial crisis. So of course, I don't expect answers, dear answers, but I just put on the floor very important questions. Huh? No, I think there are very important questions and people have touched upon them. I mean, 
Uh, there are a few things I can say. In the beginning of the paper, the reason um, how we motivated this study of fintech is another study that we have on banks. So I think there is um, just Ledis Lights and Banal Stanol and some co-authors that they have this study about uh, you know, common ownership in banks. And they have very interesting data about the banking center in Europe, okay? Because we have this other study of Bazaar and Smaltz in the US, but they show that in Europe, every country is completely different as we also show in our paper on FinTech. So that is one, for example, in, um, uh, I, I think Spain, it was that, you know, the government is very important. The UK, the story is more dispersed. It's more, it's, the story looks more like uh, the US. Scandinavia, it's in own, its own, has its own peculiarities. So essentially, uh, every country is different also for historical reasons. Okay, because ownership structure is very different. Okay, but also the governance structure. So let's say the governance of companies in Germany is completely different to the UK and so on. Okay, so these are factors that um, affect common ownership. And now on your question about how fintech interacts with uh, the banking sectors, I mean, if you like some people really want to see fintech as you know the major disruptor in the provision of financial services and so on. However, there are some authors like both on the law and the economic side, uh, and uh, most notably uh, Professor Xavier Vives that suggest that you know. Um, Although they could be a major disruptor, uh, there are many reasons why, like, and most notably, like you have these big barriers that mostly are regulatory, to be honest, why we cannot uh, perhaps see that this fintech can challenge uh, incumbent banks. So we see more of a complementary relationship, perhaps, than you know, a complete substitutable uh, disruptive situation. Uh, now, on, uh, I mean, Vivas, of course, has a lot of work about banks in general and competition and stability and this kind of things. And also the OECD, I think, when they mentioned uh, they had this uh, panel a few years ago, I think 2018, on common ownership, they mentioned how common ownership can lead uh, to tensions uh, with regards um, to financial stability as well. Uh, I mean, we don't know, but of course, uh, the, uh, the basic point that they're making in the paper from the governance side, you know, if you, if you internalize those externalities and risk uh, is more systemic, then you can see major implications here, okay? Uh, but these are issues I think that they need to be studied. So I cannot give I can give you some hints, but I think we need both theoretical and empir empirical work to really understand the very broader and big implications, I think, of this phenomena. But definitely I agree with you that these are important uh, considerations. May I make another question? to understand, I mean, uh, the way that you proceed in the, in the analysis that is that you see the common ownership of the fintech uh, firms, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what I had in mind, uh, and maybe I need some comment from you, so, suppose that you go to other uh, industries and then banks, uh, are input suppliers, no? I mean, they provide loans. In that, ca in that case, uh, the common ownership from banks to various sectors is very important. I mean, some, some comment on that because I'm, I'm, not, you know, I'm not an expert on <laughs> finance for sure. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think you hint vertical common ownership in a way, yes. right? Yes, yes. Okay. This is very interesting, and of course, it's very much uh, debated because 
one, I mean, there is both theoretical and empirical work that suggests or gives us some hints that the same dynamics could be at play and we, we could have some anti-competitive effects in terms of foreclosure and so on, mm -hmm. uh, especially when these are long-term relationships, okay? And also in this specific context that you say of banks, and it's interesting that, you know, some people ask me about these issues, you know, and they make some parallels to Japan where banks have been, you know, traditional, uh, you know, and systemic players. Uh, they're also in the governance of companies. Uh, but the broader issue and a very big question mark that we don't know. Uh, so Vives and Jose, they have also another paper that they try to show a tension between intra-industry and in their industry effects. And they show that in that situation, actually common ownership could be good. No, no. Uh, not everybody agrees, of course, or not everybody agrees on the extent. Or So I don't think for sure, as I've already, I mean, the broad message that I can give is um, what I said in the beginning, that common ownership is so interesting because it leads to different uh, directions or different harms and benefits, depending how you look at it, okay? So um, we cannot know unless, as I said, we do more empirical work of what is really going on. I mean, that's that's the very bottom line. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Camilo Riva sure. um, in the chat. Anna, do you mind uh, yeah. taking a look? Okay. Sure. Uh, hi, thanks. Given that private equity and merge couple will hold these companies in the portfolio for limited years as they tend to exit after 510, the effects are more likely to be present in the first year they have these companies. Yeah, definitely. And that is another factor. When I mentioned that uh, about the systemic effects, so uh, when you are, um, you know, a big three asset managers and you have index funds, those are more, you know, permanent, uh, so to say. So the kind of institutional ownership that you have uh, there is of a different type. And I'm definitely with you that the time horizon there could be more conducive. The dynamics are the, uh, going to the opposite direction uh, in the VC and private equity context, but it's definitely not the two-year entry horizon that, you know, for example, we see in the horizontal merger guidelines in Europe. So it's not too short either. I mean, for sure they don't have the permanent nature systemic character of index funds, uh, but still, um, I think uh, potentially in some situations that could be effect, especially, you know, I think it's quite interesting, the interplay of common ownership and private equity. And there has been some discussions in the US how private equity, they try to acquire many firms within industries, okay? and restructure those sectors, for example, hospitals and so on. So although they may not be permanent owners as you know, these asset managers still in those situations where common ownership can be pervasive, maybe we have uh, some interesting effects happening. So that is also another reason why I said we need to study the ownership and governance dynamics quite uh, closely and specifically. Okay. Um, somebody else? Uh, yes, Costas. Uh, yes. Um, thank you, Anna, for this uh, very interesting talk. Um, I have a question which is not, I mean, it's not directly to what you do in fintech, but uh, I'm, I'm interested in, in your opinion since you have been working in this subject for, for a long time. So what troubles me with the whole literature and what's also in, in the paper that you presented is this uh, calculation of, of lambdas. So uh, the, one, uh, the, the lambdas have uh, inside betas and gammas. The betas is the ownership structure and the gammas is the control structure. So we can, we can uh, have some information on the ownership structure, but 
as you said right before, you, uh, we don't actually know how the gammas relate to the betas, how the control structure of the, co the corporate governance uh, relates to the um, uh, ownership structure. And what troubles me with all the literature is that this is, I mean, I try to be in the position of a manager who uh, has many shareholders and they have portfolios. And in these portfolios, they may have, I don't know how many companies, and uh, he has to ask them all the time, uh, you know, uh, in how many companies you have uh, interests so that I can take into this, this into account before I decide. So I guess the informational burden for the manager is extreme. So what is the shortcut here? How can we have any idea on this, on this gammas? I mean, this is a general question. So what do you think? Um... People have written on this. Okay, first, what we do in the paper, just to clarify. So what we do when we estimate the lambdas and what specific, like control and governance troubles us a lot on how to estimate these lambdas, because essentially what we give you here is like a hypothetical. We don't observe uh, real data on control of these firms. We just take the ownership data and extrapolate control scenarios based on those and we try to give the two extremes that we have and even within the range of those extremes we show that common ownership is insignificant essentially okay how we do that i mean we say in the paper that in this why i mentioned it also earlier in private companies it's impossible to have data on like ownership is difficult to have but control is impossible because you know Black you need you need to have all the private agreements about control sharing between VC firms and their managers and their shareholders, the founders, basically, which is challenging because they don't have to publish them, okay? Uh, so we don't pretend to do that. And that, we suggest in a footnote that another way of doing that is to gather data about directorships. And you know how they may agree to share directors or appoint directors. And maybe that could give you an additional way to check whether this gross approach that we take in our paper gives you completely different results, okay? Maybe even high, lower numbers, maybe there's some outliers in some countries. We don't know that, but it could be one way of doing it. And this link, li links nicely to the discussion about interlocking directorates. So if you look then at the directors, then you can see one channel will be the directors through which these information barriers that you said could be mitigated also, okay? So one is that. Now, this, of course, this criticism or, you know, uh, comment that you raise has been there since the beginning of this research about control. So it's a very fair point. Also because, you know, I mean, controlling companies is a cumulative thing. So it's kind of a common good, all right? Um, so you cannot see all uh, the things that are happening there. And we're assuming also things, okay? To generalize and predict outcomes. Now, another mechanism that has been suggested uh, besides the directors, is this executive compensation packages, okay? And in that situation, the argument is, even if they know nothing about the ownership structure, the fact that they have this incentive already gives them uncompetitive incentives to the managers, okay? So they need to know nothing about their specific owners. They may not care at all about them even, okay? Um, the third uh, point that I want to make that even if you don't have any of this, uh, the argument goes that uh, even on a pure incentive basis, in some situation when you don't have bigger block holders, maybe um, there are some anti-competitive effects in the sense that knowing the managers that their common shareholders you know, will not object, maybe they relax a little bit. So it's not that they listen to the managers and they coordinate on the prices and they have all this crazy input on the information, but maybe uh, prices are raised because uh, managers are not so eager to minimize costs, okay? So this cost minimization objective of the firms also 
under common ownership is challenged. And Smalt says something about that that I think is very, very interesting. And I think he has also a new paper on that. So there are some dynamics that we don't understand. So it could also have implications common ownership for the productivity of firms, in other words, that I think it's significant. So another indirect way how the managers can play in here, I think. Uh, thank you so much. So if I may add on this, so if we take the approach of the executive compensation, then uh, this executive compensation is coming from the board of the directors or the, there is some voting. I doubt that there is some voting on, on what will be the contract that will be given to the manager. I mean, as you said, it's an aggregate, it's a accumulative. So if you want to accumulate the, the aggregate, the preferences of shareholders, I don't know to what extent uh, these shareholders are voting on the, uh, the executive uh, uh, compensation scheme. So, so do you know if they are voting or not? I, mean... I think, uh, and that is why I go on the specificity of governance. In the US, it's voluntary that, you know, the say on pay, like it's voluntary basically, but you know, there is more of a nudge, like it's encouraged in the US context, but it's not in a mandatory rules. In other countries, it depends, okay? And in Europe, it's a little bit more tight, um, but it really depends from country to country. But the most obvious mechanism, as you say, is through the directors, where you have a direct line and it's more observable as well, okay? Thank you, thank you. Somebody else? So if I may ask a couple of things. So you had this slide where you referred to both common and cross. Yeah. Um, so the, the first question there was, uh, which comes first? I guess the next slides answer that. So I guess cross comes first, common comes second, when I become public, or this is not the case. I think it depends. I mean, once a uh, challenge we had and why we thought about this, I mean, we discovered this while writing the paper. Like we said, okay, how we define fintech? We took the definition of fintech of how we found it in the databases, but then we saw PayPal and PayPal is also a cross owner, right? So we saw these different patterns and then we try to find some justification about them. Like why PayPal they want to engage in this MA or why do they have many common holdings while they're already a competitor? And we try to make then you can see you can connect it to this uh, dichotomy between private public margins that I gave you, but I think there is more. Okay. And that is what we're trying. We are not pretending that we're solving this, but it's just another topic that we bring up. And I think we need a completely new paper to do justice to this situation and study more concretely the, the full enterprise. But the challenge is also that, you know, we don't have a lot of data about this minority um, acquisitions either, especially when they're not, they don't trigger mer merger thresholds and they're not reportable basically. Okay, and, and the second one, if I may. Yeah. Um, so you, we refer to the effect of going public to this phenomenon, right? So if I am private, then I am, uh, then common ownership is low, then I become public, eventually common ownership goes up. Okay. Um, do you think that the decision of going public uh, or remaining private, or going public and then going back to private again. Is this affected by this phenomenon perhaps? So I know that if I go public, I will be exposed to overlapping owner to common ownership. So I'm, am I in a hurry to do that or am I, or do I want to stay public private for a longer uh, time? Do you think that there is a strategic uh, uh, behavior yes. there? To be honest, you know, before this paper, we discussed other ideas with Jose because we had another, anyway, like there's a long uh, background on this. Remember the first slide, why we had this, uh, this pie chart in the beginning when I showed you that asset managers have only 2% of total investments, but I highlighted that all, that is only direct investments, number one. And number two is, of course, we don't know 
like to what extent also these private investors, VC and private equity and public uh, asset managers, so to say, they also have a symbiotic relationship. So you could also think of a story, oh, it's great for um, uh, common VCs to uh, sell those companies because they can get some of the rent, the future rent, uh, let's say that they will be um, in the public markets. There is another story also that some of these entry uh, and common VC uh, startup growth uh, literature highlights that another dynamic effect that could happen is that, you know, this um, private common ownership uh, uh, that can uh, stimulate more uh, innovation and entrepreneurship uh, can mitigate the short-term uh, anti-competitive effects of public common ownership. So again, I see opposing uh, directions here. It, it will be challenging, I think, to um, directly study this, but I think it's super interesting uh, and very, very significant. I see, thanks. Somebody else, perhaps? Yeah, maybe yes, I, would yes. also, I, I was just wondering about the comparison with the pharmaceutical industry, for instance. So if we think about how ownership evolves, when um, firstly, um, maybe there's a, an interesting idea, but it's still very risky. Um, and then oftentimes these are relatively small companies, perhaps uh, private, um, I, I don't know, uh, and then somehow as the as the uh, innovation matures and and um, um, so then the, these companies are or maybe um, will will become uh, bought up, for example, or become part of a bigger corporation, and and so so in that sense, I was wondering if there are any insights about the comparison between fintech on the one hand and the pharmaceutical industry on the other hand i mean we uh, as i mentioned one uh, uh, why we came up also with this section on m a was precisely the pharmaceutical setting and this study by ederer and all about killer acquisitions and we also i mean we try also you know there is one sentence in the paper that we give some comparative numbers of the level and effects of common ownership in the pharma context. And I think we show that the numbers in FinTech are even lower. So perhaps the fact that we have patents and other, like still the nature of competition is a little bit different in pharma. Uh, I think it suggests that uh, FinTech, it's even more open, more dynamic, more innovative, more risky in a way than the pharma example that although is a risk initially, then you can protect your ends a little bit better, if I may say that. But it's interesting. I think, um, yeah, it would be interesting to see how this uh, compares more broadly. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, if there are no more questions, we can thank our uh, speaker for today, Anna Zanaki. Thank you again for uh, joining us today and for the very interesting presentation. And of course, uh, we would be very happy to have you also in person uh, at some point soon, um, we hope. So again, thanks a lot. Uh, guys, don't forget that, uh, and ladies, don't forget that another seminar by Camilo Riva is um, following in a couple of weeks. Again, in the same topic, empirical research, that one. Um, yeah, hopefully we are learning something about this literature after all these seminars. So thanks a lot. Take thanks care. Thanks to all okay. of you and for your Thank questions. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye. Bye.